The May Day weekend at Donington Park started with the Swinging 60s series, where me and Tim Morant would be driving Simon Lewis's XJ6. It wasn't our day. Qualifying was cut short with clutch failure, and we thought that our day was done. However, Colin Philpott, Chris Boone and Mike Holt had other ideas. They absolutely descended on the car, put in a heroic shift, and we got it turned around in time for the race. Tim took the start, and found out that you can't cheat fate. The gearbox failed, and he had to park it. The old girl really didn't want to know this weekend, but I still enjoyed the brief time that I had in the car, and I'm really grateful to Simon for the opportunity. And so it was out of the lovely XJ6 that couldn't, and it was into the bruised old battle tank that shouldn't, but usually does. For rounds 3 and 4 of the JEC saloons and GTs, we would be mixing our grid with the Creative 3 series, probably not too surprising after what happened at Silverstone. I had a good qualifying session and managed to get in a 1 minute 23 dead, which is an excellent lap by my standards. If I thought that that would put me comfortably ahead of the class, however, I was mistaken. Derek Pierce lay only 5 hundredths of a second behind me, so going into the first race, I knew that I had my hands very much full. In my preview of Donington Park, I predicted lots of action and some really hairy moments, and it certainly delivered. Mixing the grids produced some real cut and thrust action, with a host of ruthless drivers up front, all trying to take advantage of the different cars' abilities. The smaller, lighter touring cars milling around the big, brawny jags. I was focused on Derek Pierce, keeping him behind me was paramount, so I wasted no time in getting around the outside of Mark Lucock at Hollywood, and now I was nipping at the heels of David Howard in front, trying to keep cars between me and Derek. My progress was slightly curtailed when Tom Lenfell's robust move at Coppice saw me take an escort to the face, but a slip up the inside of Redgate meant that I kept Derek at bay, and at this point, things were going well. I was running at the sharp end, the car was going well, and I was head of the class. Little did I know that the plotline was about to be turned upside down. Sadly, this race came to be defined by a first lap oil spill which circled almost the entire perimeter of the circuit. It caught a lot of drivers out and caused plenty of mishaps, but luckily nothing serious. It took me way too long to clock what was going on, and I had a few big moments tumbling down the order. By the time I realised that there was oil down, my race was ruined. Although I found myself having a good battle with Tom Robinson, the class win was long gone. If it seems unusual for me to have been fighting with Tom, that's because it was. The Swallows car wasn't having the smoothest weekend either. It was only on the very last lap that a familiar grey shape came into view. Derek had slipped up a couple of times on loose oil, easily done, and suddenly he was within shooting distance. As we entered the chicane for the final time, I knew it was all or nothing for the class win. I certainly wasn't shy about using the kerbs, but with the oil that was down on the outside of the entry, they pretty much become part of the racing line at this point anyway. I earned myself a bit of a ribbon for cutting the chicane, but the class win was there for the taking, and I took it. On to the second race then, and although I was excited to have a genuine fist at it without the chaos of the first race, really the MO was exactly the same. Try and win the class. Although my start wasn't great, I kept Derek behind me. I was jostling again with Tom Robinson. Meanwhile, it was free for the class lead. Derek was right behind me, and Rick Walker was hovering dangerously. Behind him was Mike Holt, who'd made an unbelievable start from the back of the grid. As James Ram made his escape up front, I was ambushed down the back straight, Derek taking the class lead away. In fact, the XK8 was really making moves. 
I'd been caught off guard and let Derek slip up my inside, but I thought that a good exit from the chicane might see me hang on to him. I was wrong. The grey machine hunkered down and shot off towards Redgate, flying past Tom Robinson's car in the process. I didn't have the horsepower to follow him through that gap, and I feared that I was about to get left behind, so I was lucky that the Swallows man didn't take it lying down. Tom's move at the old hairpin enabling me to get back on terms. The bun fight that developed between these two monster machines was really my saving grace. As Derek launched one at the inside of Tom at the chicane, he locked up and went wide, and I seized the opportunity. All of this was being monitored closely by Mike Holt and Rick Walker, who were hovering behind, but Rick's race came to a spectacular end when he was claimed by the Craner Curves. Tom Robinson led from me, from Derek Pearce, from Mike Holt as we plunged into the Creative Free Touring car crowd. I was driving my socks off to keep the others at bay, but the pressure finally relented when Tom Robinson succumbed to his engine issues, the ailing XJR6 catching out everyone it seemed except for me and Mike Holt who swept around the outside. Mike finishing his move with a flourish with an awesome display of bravery and control into the chicane. Free from that gaggle of cars, the pair of us now closed up to the battling triumph and escort of Mark Osborne and Stephen Primmett. I was stuck behind the escort for lap after lap, I couldn't find a move that worked, until it finally came to me, around the outside of the left hand of the craners and into the old hairpin. I was hoping to ease my way past the triumph as well, but again I found myself frustratingly impotent. The smaller and lighter touring cars were so late on the brakes and turning in with so much speed compared to the big jags that it made it really hard to get anything to stick. In fact, it was Holty who was on the offensive, besting me on the brakes into the chicane and going after the Dolomite Sprint. This was a really hard and enjoyable fight into the closing stages of the race, although I did eventually have to embrace the idea of just getting the car home. The class win was secure and there was nothing else to be gained. Mike kept the pressure on right until the last run through the chicane, which opened up an opportunity. At the line, we were all covered by less than half a second, although we did nearly meet a sticky end when Mark Osborne hit the brakes after crossing the finish line. For me, it was two class wins from two races, a stunning result, much like James Ram, who was dominant at the front of the field. Tom Robinson's issues were plain to see, that car wasn't running right all weekend, and although Colin Philpot and Guy Conyu were there or thereabouts, they each had their own issues to contend with, which meant James swept up. It was a bit of a shame that we were deprived of a chance to see the front runners really going at it at Donington, but I'm sure there'll be plenty more to come from the rest of this season. The next stop is Castle Coombe at the start of July, and I'm already excited.